It's World Cup time in Africa. Now, some say soccer and politics never mix. But what happens when they do? We've two films about African football stars on the edge of power. In this life on the edge, the soccer star as political player. You can see it across Africa, young men trying to become football stars, and often playing the game just for the love of it. But behind these everyday scenes are extraordinary stories of lives on the edge, and none more so than the story of this team's coach. Today, George has been helping train a team of young people and veterans in Ghana. Next week, he might be back home in nearby Liberia or in Florida, USA, where he's studying business administration and criminal justice, the kind of education which, like many of these kids, he's never had. Few footballers have lived in a more globalised world than George Weir, African world football star. Well, uh, coming from the ghetto, you know, I've, I've uh, endured the, the pain of suffering and uh, uh, that uh, gave me the sense of you know, being there for people, because I know that uh, it's not a good thing for people to suffer, you know, but I came from that environment, and I think it's not a pleasant environment for people to be. So the, I always want to strive for, to help, you know, to be there for people, you know. So we were 15 in a, in a home that we all grew up to love each other, and it taught me uh, the sense of loving, you know, the sense of caring, you know, that, that, was, that, that is important to me, and that I can use that, you know. And I used that in my career when I was playing, you know, loving people, you know, making people happy, you know, my friends around me, you know, and, um, that's how you can help me. George was brought up in the Claritown district of Monrovia, the capital of Liberia. It's a country struggling with the legacy of civil war and with grinding poverty. With average income still under $200 a year, Liberia's not yet on track to meet the Millennium Development Goals. And most voters are still illiterate. George's uncle showed us the house where George was raised by his grandmother, with over a dozen siblings and relatives. George lived here when he was playing for Invincible Eleven. This is the room George used to be in. George used to play yard football at the time, playing football in the yard. George would go to school. He would go to school, but hmm, he liked soccer more than school. Once our grandmother had a dream about him, she knew that one day he was going to be a great star. When was the last time you saw him? Well, we saw, we him, saw him last in, in 2005. 2005. The young woman who lives in George's room now has her own heroes. But in the living room, there are still memories of a Liberian star. His love for the ball helped George Weir outgrow his childhood environment. The boy from the Monrovia slums grew to be World Footballer of the Year, playing for clubs like Chelsea and AC Milan. Nowadays, George's home in Liberia is a little more uptown. In the early 70s, football coach Pampin discovered the young George, remembered now as a little lazy, but already a great dribbler on the ball. Campaigns still welcome in George's new home and showed us round while George was away in Ghana. This is Milan. When, this is Milan. when Milan beat Juventus and so won the championship, 
This is the time Milan beat Juventus 2-1 and made Milan champion. George Best gave him this because he was the only man who wore the number nine shirt in Europe. He can't forget me. George can't do that. If George is playing in Europe and wants to call anybody here, he asks for me. He's going to ask for me. If he wants me, I'm going to be there. Any day he wants me, I'll be there. So he doesn't forget. Pampin met George at the age of six. Little did he know that 23 years later, his pupil would be elected European, African and World Player of the Year, 1995. George grew up like everyone else here. He used to play around with friends. We played marbles. You know marbles? Yeah, we played so well. I want to show you the football we used to play with. It was made of paper and plastic bags then, because we didn't have a football. And this is what George and the other friends used to play with. He was a poor guy. He was a poor boy, yeah. He was a poor boy growing up. But he loved football so much. He didn't know he was going to be somebody. But I knew he was going to become a star. Because the way he played with us, he was too good. And I knew he was going to be somebody else far off. But when he was with us, he loved football. It's a basketball. Today, the ball's a bit heavy for Pampin. But then, he's only been able to find a basketball. A basketball, not a football. He's down to F. He's not like the other people who forget you when they get famous. Go up, then they forget what you know. Josh, Josh, whether he's famous or not, he will help you out. Yeah. yeah, I love that man. Even while he played for the national team, George was having political disagreements with some of his colleagues. He was a team player who could still go his own way. We were uh, together on the team and we took the team to another level where we actually have that series of differences based on my own principles and his you know, way of thinking. But uh, beyond that, we, we, we got along you know, socially. But when it came to uh, principle-based issues, uh, we had some differences. And uh, along those lines, we, we disagree to agree without being disagreeable. In 2005, George Weir ran for president of Liberia in the first election since the end of the Civil War. With supporters, he'd formed his own party, the CDC, Congress for Democratic Change. Vote for a president who can be trusted by the international community. Vote for George Mana Weir to the presidency of Liberia. His only real qualification, he was a national hero who could unite the country. He won the first round, but narrowly lost out to the current president, the economist Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. George Weir says he'll be happy to run against her again. My vision is, uh, you know, to to have a you know secure and a stable stable uh, uh, society and a uh, united society, you know, to develop my country, you know, develop my people, to put in the basic necessities that they need, you know, to grow. You know, this is my plan. Okay, and how do you want to execute it? How am I going to execute that? Well, uh, the job is not given to me yet, but uh, that's why we're recruiting professional people. We're talking to people every day just in case the opportunity comes and then we can start our work. The founder of our party, Mr. Weir, uh, came into politics because he, he, he felt very disappointed by the way the country is the poverty is still on the rise, and there's nobody caring. Mm -hmm. So that's how the CDC came about to be formed. Mm -hmm. That we are not traditional politicians. We are Liberians who are convinced that we can help. But not every former footballing colleague of Liberia's great star believes he's the right guy for the job. 
Some now support President Johnson Sirleaf, and one at least reckons football is scant preparation for the presidency. Mr. George Weir, my friend and brother, has only been concerned with the playing of football. He has achieved the zenith, the epiphany of football. Today, he's one of the world best. But when it comes to administration vis-a-vis -vis politics, I don't think this is his niche. I don't think that's his area. And this is what Ellen has gained. It's like asking the president of Liberia today to be the coach of Barcelona. That career is gone, you know. I will always be remembered because of my contribution in uh, uh, the soccer society. But if I, didn't, if I didn't do well in soccer, I show people who will look that. If I gone to, let's say I went to Europe to play and one year I left and joined into politics, people, people, nobody was going to say anything, you know. But because I, I, did, I did my good, so people remember that. But again, you cannot limit me. Then you're telling me why Nelson Mandela became a boxer or a sportsman and then he went into law and he became a politician. That's what you're telling me. Is that wrong? No. Then we'll be questioning uh, uh, what? Uh, uh, president Reagan, you know, being a, a, a movie actor and then become president. Then we're going to tell Swashaniga, uh, Arnold Swashaniga, that he was a movie actor, then he become a mayor. <laughs> George Weir's new game may be politics, but he's still in touch with his football roots. For better or worse, it's the basis of his appeal, especially with young men. Today, he's been playing in Ghana for fun and exercise with veterans and youngsters. Wherever his travels take him, he's most at home in these West African ghettos, just like his home back in Liberia. And football offers some interesting tactical lessons. You know, it doesn't matter whether we're losing or not. You know, what we wanted to do is to balance our game. And then we work on their weaknesses. Their weakness was at the end, you know, and then we use that against them and we beat them. That may be a useful tactic when it comes to winning votes. Politics is not why he's here today, but it's never far from his mind. Even having fun in Ghana, George Weir's keen to present himself as Liberia's man of the people. I mean, we come here to socialize, you know, this is our social club, you know, this is our ghetto, you know, this is where we grew up. So we, yeah, you know, see our young friends, you know, that we left in the ghetto. So it's a good mind also to keep the blood flowing, you know. Yeah, because if you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you're going, you know. This is all, we street kids, you know. It doesn't matter, we are successful in our own uh, our, our life, but at the end of the day, you know, the people that we, you know, we know from, in the ghetto, we must socialize with them because that, that's the only connections, you know? My people still believe in me, and I'm still on board, and uh, going to convention will determine what I will go, uh, I will go again. But up to now, my people still believe that I'm the person they want, you know, and they want to take me back to, to the democratic elections. But back in Liberia, there's another side to this story of the ghetto and of Liberia's young men. It was while George was playing in Europe that civil war ravaged the country, killing over a quarter of a million Liberians. There was no shelter from the storm. Warring factions recruited boys and sometimes girls as child soldiers, keeping them high on drugs arming them with modern weapons and encouraging the most extreme kinds of disorder and violence. You were at the front line? Yes, I was on the front line. Did you carry a gun? Yes, I carried a gun. Did you kill? Yes, I killed my enemy. I was just protecting my family and myself because by very self I was fighting the war too. But I did not suffer any harm. I was a little boy when I started to carry arms on my head. I killed. The soldiers I killed were plenty. Yeah, plenty. During this war, my people died. My father and mother died during the war. The people gave us hard drugs and when we took it, we felt brave to go to the front. Sometimes 
I took it and I feel nothing. My only feeling was to kill or be killed. The worst thing I did was on Broad Street. I shot one boy in the leg, and when I look at him, I felt bad. Yeah, and he died right on the spot. My commander said, this man is your enemy, and then we will catch you and tie you and carry you, you know? And he will order to kill this man, which is an individual, and I kill him. It was so sad, you know? I couldn't even comprehend that. While Liberia will be killing each other, and every day was the same story on, on television, and CNN was not even making it better for us. Unimaginable, you know, it was hard to accept, you know, it was hard to accept. And I know each and every Liberian felt so bad, because we had a beautiful country before, the country that everybody was going to, free country, you know, very peaceful, and to see it in chaos, you know, it, it was sudden, you know, it was sudden. I don't know how to explain that, but I think some part of our heart was broken, you know. George's rival, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, a politician of long standing, took over a country in chaos. Former combatants, her priority too. Finding the jobs for our thousands and thousands of young people uh, who were either victims of the war or ex-combatants, and giving them skills to enable them to become uh, viable citizens. That's our biggest challenge because they're unemployed, and that means that they're very vulnerable uh, to being recruited for other things. In selling himself to young people, football is a huge plus for George Weir in more ways than one. He was playing in Europe during the Civil War, so he can boast of keeping clear of warlords and the old politics. When George and the national team took to the pitch, it said the guns on all sides stopped firing. During the war, he never took part in any rebel activity. It's not a war law. That's why I love him. No one but we are will work. He's the only one we believe in, and we know he can make a difference. I'll be happy for George Weir to become president of Liberia, because during the disarmament, he came to us, he talked to us, and because of him, we disarmed willingly. These boys stuck together after the war. Normally, they roam the streets of Monrovia, but today they found some distraction watching a local football tournament. To find out why they worship George Weir as more than a footballer, we asked two of them, Mohammed and Tommy, to take us home. Mohammed was seven when he was a child soldier. He's now 15. Although he still has a mother, he lives out on the streets with his friends. Mohammed, yeah. when was the last time you saw your mom? Last time I saw my mom. Last time I saw my mom, three months ago. Three months ago? Yeah. I don't do it. Why don't you go to her? Can you tell me? We're afraid what she will be like. But if we go together, it's okay? The reunion of Mohammed with his mother is not of the heartwarming kind. Mohammed's mother has had a leg injury for years. It makes it hard for her to earn a living. Mohammed's slum-dwelling behavior doesn't make things easier for her, and she doesn't have the means to send him to school. Would you like to go back to school? Yes, I want that. Then I wouldn't have any troubles anymore then I could earn some money and get some rest because here you will never change. Come on, boy, say something. I have nowhere to sleep. My only dream now is for Mohammed to go to school. What can I do? I'm forced to go on the road and to sell things. There's no help for me. All I want to tell my mother is that I want to go to school. 
Are yeah, you? water. water this is the well water we drink. drink. All, All come, come from here. here. Former child soldier Tommy Smith is now 20. He took us to his home in the streets of the center of Monrovia. We sleep here. We sleep here. I sleep, on the I sleep here. I sleep on the ground, on the street. We haven't got a house. We haven't got any money. Let me show you the toilet area. In the next presidential election, in 2011, the plight of these young men will be a big issue. And George Weir wants their support. The issue in 2011, one of the issues will be addressing the plight of the young people. And I think the political party that will have a set program, a set way of dealing with that issue, will end up winning the elections. They can play a key role because in terms of voting in Liberia, we don't look at whether this guy is drug or this guy is an escom or this guy was involved in this. Once you have your voting card, you can vote. And these are people who are registered voters. We saw it in 2005. We saw it during the by-elections in Mosorado. So these are not people you can just write off. It's not only George, the presidential candidate, who's been concerned with the fate of Liberia's younger generation. In the aftermath of the war, he joined forces with the UN to disarm child soldiers. I played my part. You know, Liberia is my country, and I want to see Liberia stable and and united, you know, and I was called to, to help this arm because the, the United Nations felt that the, the young kids look up to me. You know, I was a living example that uh, we shouldn't be using guns, you know, instead of going back to school and uh, uh, being a meaningful people in life, you know, and then I had to serve my country. So I came back and talked, I spoke to them. And what I did, uh, it was just simple, you know, care for them, you know, invite them to my home and we discussed and let them know that uh, it's time for peace and stability in our country. You know, it's time for reconciliation, and uh, I don't think the arms will be good for them. Instead, they should take a pencil or a pen to do that. You know, so that, that, that was my, my message to them. This school was funded by the George Weir Foundation. It's in Claritown, where he grew up. The teachers are volunteers. With projects like this, George Weir wants to be seen not just as the champion of child soldiers, but of ghetto youth generally. Suppose you will become president. Can you change their fate? They all want to go to school. Well, definitely, definitely. I will change their fate, you know, and I have done it already. You know, I use my own funds by educating young people. I think the, uh, uh, one of my, my primary goal is to make sure that I educate these young people, make them to a meaningful citizen. You know, and uh, I was one of them before, and I think that uh, I can take them from that, that situation for them to be a better people, because each and every librarian should take part to, to rebuild our country. But rebuilding this impoverished and insecure country is no easy task. GDP is still lower than before the Civil War, and President Johnson Sirleaf is seen by many to be losing her fight against corruption. That's left a big...